So today we are going to be talking about the Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science program. My name is Christy Jones and I'm an education advisor at the university today and I'm joined by Dr. Mickey Noble, who's the program head for this program and Dr. Matt Dodd, who is a professor within the program. So Mickey and Matt, do you want to just do a quick introductions on yourself a little bit before we head into the next slide? Um, sure. Um, as as uh, Christy said, my name is Mickey Noble. Um, I've been the program head for eesh, a long time now. Um, forever. Forever, yes, it does seem that way. Um, and we are really excited to uh, see you today um, to basically show you a little bit about our program, the jobs you can get afterwards, and some really cool pictures of our labs. Oh, that's me. Okay, I'm Matt Dodd, and I'm a professor in the school. Um, I joined Rose from the very beginning, and uh, my background is environmental chemistry. So if you come on campus, you get to see me a lot in the lab and in class on chemistry-related stuff. And I like uh, talking about metals like arsenic and lead, so you hear more about it. Perfect. Thank you both. And now that we've introduced ourselves, I will mention as well that we do have some folks behind the scenes helping us as well that you can't see. Um, so Selena Kunar is uh, helping us out today with any tech challenges that you may have. So if you run into any issues, I see there may have been some sound issues, but we can help troubleshoot that through the chat if you just wanna send us a message. And we also have Christine here from our enrollment team, and she is here to also help answer any questions in the chat box throughout the session. Alrighty, and then now that we've introduced all of our team here, if you do want to let us know who you are as well, feel free to type away in the chat box and let us know where you're joining from, uh, what drew you to the webinar, if you're working in the industry already, what um, kind of field you're in or what kind of job you're working in right now, anything that you feel like sharing, just feel free to type away so we know who is in the room. And as you do that, I'll take us through the rest of our agenda. So we will be going through a brief overview of the Royal Roads University experience and what it's like to be a student with us, then going through the program specific information, the application process and requirements. And of course, we wanna answer your questions all throughout the webinar. And we wanna make this an informal and conversational session today. So feel free to just use the chat box for that purpose. And chances are, if you're thinking of a question, somebody else is thinking of the same question too. So please don't be shy. Alrighty, so a little bit about us. Uh, the first thing we have here is that we are in Ashoka U um, University. So this is a designation that has been given to a select number of institutions. And it means that the type of education that we provide is very interdisciplinary. It's very solutions oriented. It's very um, entrepreneurial. So this is something that we are very proud of and is something that um, we infuse throughout all of our programs. A little bit more about uh, what we value. So the first one on the list here is first names first. So we like to give a very um, personalized experience at Royal Roads and we often have a smaller class size than some of the larger institutions. So you aren't as likely to run into the, the big auditorium feeling where you're just kind of one number in the sea of students. So no matter who you're communicating with at the university, whether that's obviously your classmates, but also your professors, anyone from like the program area and our student services and such, it's always on a first name basis. The next value on here is our real world classroom. So we have what we call um, here scholar practitioners who teach you all throughout your program. So these are folks who are both um, researching and or working in their industry right now. So that means that anything that you're learning throughout all of your classes is very current, it's very up to date, and it's really applicable to the career that you're gonna go out and start right after this program. Next one here is learn together forever. So this is a reference to the cohort model we have here. And that means that you start the program with a, the, a group of people and learn with them throughout the whole program and then finish with them. So um, I should mention as well that I'm an alumni of Royal Roads from a different program. And this is one of my favorite parts about being a student at Royal Roads is the network that you get to form. And honestly, what you get to learn from your other classmates can be 
sometimes just as valuable as the classes themselves because they come from such a wide variety of backgrounds. Um, and this becomes a network that lasts far beyond um, just the classroom experience and can be drawn on as a network for both personal and professional reasons for years to come. And the last one on here is life is also an education. So this is a reference to our flexible admissions model, which we'll be digging into a little bit further into the webinar. Um, but what this means is we look at who you are holistically when you're um, applying to our programs and not just what it says on your transcript. So we like to take into account um, all the experiences you have, whether that's also um, professional experience, volunteer experience, any specific projects you work on, we think it's all valuable um, to the program that you're applying to. Alrighty, so I'm just gonna check out the chat box here to see who is joining us today. Amazing, so we have Amanda here who's taking the water and wastewater technician program at Algonquin College, wonderful. We have someone from New Brunswick. Wonderful, thank you for joining us. And if you haven't typed into the chat box yet and you wanna introduce yourself, feel free to type away there. Hi, Brandon, who's um, graduated from Advanced Biotech at Algonquin College, wonderful. Perfect, so the program delivery models. So we have for this program, a blended delivery model and an on-campus delivery model. So the blended means that you're doing a mix of online courses and in-person residencies when it's safe to do so. And on-campus is exactly like it sounds, it's our on-campus courses, but of course we've shifted those due to um, COVID-19 and adapted those to be online as well. And Mickey, I'm wondering if you want to speak to at this point here, um, what that has looked like with those courses being translated online and also what we might, um, expect over the next couple of months, according to the information. Sure. And now. Well, okay, so what's what's kind of happened in the, in the face of COVID is our on-campus program has been using a delivery model very similar to this, where everybody's logged in at the same time and we're still encouraging discussion and it's still in that kind of lecture format. So Again, if you're somebody that you know needs to know that a Monday morning at 8.30 you're taking chemistry, you can still have that experience. Um, where we are looking to go for the fall um, is that uh, you will be on campus for labs, uh, field work, many of the orientation activities that normally go for uh, go along with this with starting a program. Um, but it is very likely that the lecture portion of the program is going to still be delivered in a format like this up until Christmas. Um, so you'll still have lots of opportunity to get to know everybody, start to get to know the faculty. You'll see Matt and I and uh, my partner in crime, Sharon McMillan, who's our lab coordinator, um, frequently, several times a week uh, <laughs> for labs and field work. And we're also really excited that we can, we'll be bringing back our major project as part of our lab and field program this year. So that, that'll be actually pretty awesome. Um, in January, assuming that the COVID numbers continue to go down and everything's looking good, we would be looking to have you on campus full-time uh, with lectures in the classroom starting in January. So that's our current plan we are updating it as we get more information from public health and um and going forward we are um actually going to be having the current on-campus class coming back to campus for labs and field work starting in june um so we're spending a lot of time right now developing our safety protocols and just making sure that we're confident with our plan as we roll it out um, so by the time you guys get here, we'll have had uh, basically 12 weeks of practice at it. So we should be really, uh, really good at our safety plan by that point. Perfect. Thank you so much for that update. And of course, when it is safe to come back on campus, we are so excited for you to be here. And here's a little snapshot of what it looks like. So the last photo I will mention is kind of, we'll go back. Um, an outside view of our lab there. It's a beautiful new building. So it's a fantastic place to learn. And then here's a bit more. So the top left hand corner there is Hatley Castle. Um, it was built in the early 1900s and is a um, focal point on our campus. 
So um, there is staff that work in there and events when we're able to have those. Um, so it's very much used as a working building and it's really a hub of activity on our campus. The top right hand corner is the Japanese gardens. So kind of right adjacent to the castle there, we have a whole network of interconnected gardens that you can go and explore. So the Japanese gardens is just one of them, but we also have the Italian gardens, we have the rose gardens, uh, croquet lawn. So lots of beautiful places for you to explore. And then on the bottom left hand corner, we have Esquimalt Lagoon. So we're also right on the water. And if you are a nature lover, this is a bird sanctuary. So there's lots for you to um, check out right close to the water and it's a very tranquil place um, between classes to go check out. And, and I if, should... I may, if I may jump in, Christy. Yeah. Yeah, as kind of lagoon, we do our, uh, some of our labs on the lagoon. So for example, we take a sediment course, uh, graphs, water samples from the lagoon. So it's part of the lab, field lab right there. Yeah, Thanks. thank you for adding that. That's so perfect. And we also are on over 500 acres of old growth forest. So um, Which lots of- Which will be happily exploring with our ecology professor. Um, and he will be very happy to show you um, the Magna Carta tree. So which is one of the oldest trees um, actually in the province. So there you go. Whoa, I actually didn't know that. So I'm, <laughs> I'm learning <laughs> stuff too live. Um, so we really do um, utilize our campus as part of your learning, especially in this program. Um, but of course, the bottom right hand uh, picture there is just a bit of an ode to the fact that we have been doing online learning for over 25 years now. Um, so we've been very easily able to uh, adapt with the pandemic and everything like that to switch anything that has been on campus to online and vice versa. Um, so we're ready for whatever is to come as well. And then we also offer a wonderful learning experience online through our blended program. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Mickey, for a little bit more details on the program structure. Okay, um, so this is, uh, you're gonna see as we go through here, several shots of, of, the, uh, of the new lab facilities. We're, we're really um, very proud of them. Uh, we've got, as we saw in the one, one shot previous, uh, floor to ceiling windows in our labs. So lots of natural light. So it makes for a, actually a really nice place to be. Um, all right, so we have two versions of our undergrad program and really the question you need to ask yourself is how do I need this to work? <laughs> so for the on-campus program, you will be doing year three and year four in one calendar year. So you'll get here in approximately mid-September and you'll be here until the end of August. Um, doing all kinds of, uh, of interesting things while you're here. The terms are broken up into four quarters with um, weeks off in, a week off in between. So there is an opportunity for those of you who enjoy camping and that kind of thing to go out and do that sort of stuff and, and explore the island. Um, the blended program works a little differently. Uh, you'll come for a three week residency, go away for a year doing distance courses all the way through the year come for another, dis another residency on campus. Again, go away for another year, do more distance courses and come for a final residency on campus. Those residencies are both a real intensive opportunity to get to know your cohort and get to know your instructors as well as an opportunity to do lab and field work. Um, and it's a really good way to deal with it if um, our running joke is if you have the house, the spouse, and the kids, and picking up and coming to Victoria for a year is really not in the cards for you, then that might be the way to, to go about doing this. Um, it's very good for folks that are trying to work while they're doing their, uh, their degree program, uh, because usually you can take that three weeks of holidays without causing too many problems. Um, when will the on-campus sessions take place? They are generally in May. Nope, uh, it doesn't vary. Um, depending on, basically find the May long weekend and back up three weeks. <laughs> and that's always when it is. So sometimes depending on where the calendar is and that long weekend falls, we start a couple of days into April, but in general, um, the bulk of it is in May every year. We try and make it predictable so that it's really easy for you to book that time off with your employer. Um, next slide, please. Um, 
other than, than that sort of timing piece, uh, the major difference between the on-campus and the blended program is course content. Um, and it's really only one small difference. So if you are in the on-campus program, you will do the major project, which as I said, we're really excited to be bringing back this year, um, which is an opportunity for you to do a team-based consulting project for a sponsor that is going to give you an opportunity to get out and get some relevant experience. Um, some of the projects involve lab work, some of them involve field work, some of them involve both. Um, we generally have a, a good mix of projects in any given year. Um, and this is really valuable, particularly if you are switching into the environmental field for the first time, or you don't have any actual work experience. It's a way to show an employer, hey, I've got some experience doing a big project and I kind of know what that looks like. So that's uh, a really valuable piece. For those who are taking the blended program, because doing that lab and field piece is not really uh, an option in that schedule, um, you guys are getting two different courses that have more emphasis on business and management. So tools for business decision making and public policy formulation, um, both of which give you that um, sort of additional management opportunity kind of uh, areas. It fits pretty well for those that take the blended program because they're typically working in the area already. So it gives them a chance to tune up those management skills a little bit more. Um, everything else, you get the same lab and field experience um, and you get all the same courses otherwise. So there'll be chemistry, there'll be microbiology, there'll be law, there'll be sustainability, um, all kinds of things. It's really meant to be a very diverse program and give you a really general set of skills um, that you can take out into the work world. Next slide, please. Um, so I've already touched on this a little bit. So this is just a taster of the courses that are included in, in both programs. Um, lots of different stuff. You are not meant to be uh, a specialist in any one area when you graduate from this program. You're really meant to be um, that generalist that is going to be able to span and talk to teams that have all of these individual specialties on them um, so that you can really tie them together. Um, all right, prerequisites for the program. Um, 60 credits of undergraduate studies, uh, including two post-secondary chemistry, two biology, two math, and two English. Um, for the math, we, we really recommend uh, that you have uh, at least some experience with calculus. It makes hydrology a lot easier if, if you're not struggling with that. Um, looking for a B average. And uh, 24 credits at the second year level as well. Okay. If you look at that and you think, ooh, that's not quite me. <laughs> uh, we do have options for flexible assessment, although even for flexible assessment, we are still looking for those two chemistry, two biology, two math, and two English. Um, basically because without that background piece, student, we find students really struggle in the program. So we might uh, flexibly assess your work experience against the 60 credits, but we really want you to have those basics uh, in place. Um, we do have block transfer agreements with, ooh, I want to say around 80 colleges right now for a whole bunch of different programs. Matt, do you know how many exactly? Uh, it's a lot. We'll say a lot. I know somebody from Algonquin, and we have a transfer agreement with Algonquin College, as an and, example. And uh, we've got somebody on here from Northern Lights as well, and we have a transfer agreement with those guys. You know, and Nate, to, somebody from Nate, we have transfer agreement with Nate. With Nate and say to Selkirk. Nate, yeah. Yep. Selkirk, yeah, we do. So, you know, definitely go to, um, go to the program page, and I'm sure that, uh, Christine can put it up for us. Um, the page that's got all our transfer agreements on there. See if you're on there. Um, even if yeah. you're not, still we do apply. Have NBCC. Somebody was asking at my New Brunswick Community College. I think so. We used um, to at one point. 
Yeah, I think so. Um, even if your program's not up there, apply anyway. You'll be sending us your transcripts. So we'll be, um, mm -hmm. Matt and I will have a look and we'll be able to, it's 40 transfer agreements, but I think it's around 80 different programs once we break it open. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's a good chance you're on there already. If you're not, apply anyway. Um, your file will just get sent from admissions over to Matt and I so we can have a look uh, after Christine's had a boo and, uh, and we'll have a look and let you know if you're missing anything. Um, yeah, so, you know, don't panic if you think, oh, I, I'm one chemistry short or something, apply anyway. We can give you a conditional admission and you can pick up that extra chemistry course between now and, and your start date. Um, yeah, next slide, please. The next one we have on here is the professional certifications, but I'm not sure if you and Matt maybe want to touch on a little bit more about the courses um, and what they're like once you tick all those prereqs off of the box and apply for the program. Um, yeah, I suppose we could do that. Um, your cohort will probably be somewhere between 25 and 40 about the average cohorts we've had the, the last few years. So you will get to know everybody obnoxiously well. Um, yep. <laughs> it is very much like teaching in a small town where everybody knows everybody else's mm -hmm. business. Um, but that's actually a really nice feature because it gives you the chance to really form those social bonds that really help carry you through when you're having a tough time with things. Mm -hmm. And, and the other thing is, if I may jump in, is we get to know uh, students very well as uh, instructors and lab, um, lab people. And so, um, and uh, we are almost always on campus, uh, Mickey, myself, or um, Sharon. And so if you have uh, questions or issues, you can always come talk to us about it. And uh, one thing we always encourage students is talk to us if you're having issues before it become too, too big an issue. And we're always there to help. And not only us, but the program associates, people in the office are really very helpful. Very helpful, very approachable. And so, um, yeah, that's something to, uh, to consider if uh, in terms of uh, interacting with um, faculty and staff and people on campus. And, um, we usually uh, look out for students. So if in my class I see a student not doing well, I usually uh, approach them and say, hey, what's going on here? Is there something we can do to help? And so uh, keep that in mind if, if uh, that we are here. We're here for you to work with you through the program. Exactly, and there's, there's lots of supports that are available here if you're having issues of one kind or another, so. Um, you know, which are, are free and available to you. So it's, that's also a really important piece of this. Um, as far as what kinds of things you'll do, uh, you'll do lab stuff. Oh, there's the Eco Canada certification. Yes. So I may be going to um, make it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can talk about it if you want. Okay. So uh, our program it. is accredited by Eco Canada and I'm sure most of you are familiar with MRA, uh, Eco Canada. And so when you graduate, you become a certified environmental professional in training and you can apply to go through the accreditation. So because we are already accredited, it makes it easier if you want to be a certified environmental professional. And again, all the details are available on the website. And if you're not familiar with Eco Canada, you can click on Eco Canada there and check them out. The, um, it's a uh, government sector organization which works in certifying environmental professionals. So it's good to have the um, EP behind your name as another credential. It's the only national environmental certification that's available right now. Um, so Eco Canada's um, EP designation is, is really useful to you. Um, you may find that depending on what province you're in, that there are other certifications that you also want to pursue. Um, it, but that's those ones tend to vary from province to province. So, all 
right. Um, yeah, uh, classes are taught both by what we call core faculty, that's full-time faculty that work for railroads like Matt and I, um, but we also bring in um, the scholar practitioners that were mentioned early on. So these are folks that are specialists in their area. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, um, you guys may encounter um, Jade Yeeha who does work uh, along in environmental planning or uh, Jamie Clifton who does a, a lot of work in environmental communication. We bring in an environmental lawyer to teach the environmental law class. So you do have the opportunity to actually uh, interact with lots of these individuals as well. And because it's a small class, it's a great opportunity for you to actually talk to folks that have experience in some of these areas and find out a little bit more, right? Is this an area mm -hmm. that I might want to pursue after I graduate? Uh, have graduates continued registered for biologists uh, or PA? Um, PA is usually a much closer fit, much faster. Our P bio depends an awful lot on what biology courses were in the program that you came from. Um, because RP Bio requires a lot of biology courses. Um, although the RP Bio group does have a, a really good website with a really nice worksheet on it so that you can figure out, you know, what, uh, you know, what you might still be missing or, or what gaps that might be filled. So. Um, okay, so why do employers like our grads? Because at the end of the day, you guys know how to do a lot of really impressive things. Um, communication skills and technical knowledge are something that are actually commented on by a lot of um, a lot of employers. Um, teamwork is something that you're going to learn a lot about um, and you're going to learn the difference between being a group of people and actually being a team mm -hmm. um, so you'll learn a lot of a, a lot of these soft skills that we don't necessarily um, talk about right but you're also going to get a lot of content knowledge in a lot of different areas so that you'll have an, a nice awareness of sort of the complexity of the world and how different things fit together Um, as an incoming university student for fall, how soon would you recommend I arrive to Canada? Uh, I would say at least a couple weeks before classes start. Um, just so that you have time to, to self, uh, to self quarantine and, you know, time to get to know Victoria a little bit before you get into the full swing of classes. But there is uh, recommendations that are available from the international office, I think. Uh, Christine, can you help out with that? Uh, recommendations for online distance learning institutions to provide upgrades to chemistry and math. Um, I usually suggest colleges in your area because uh, it's easier to, to deal with. If you are looking for online institutions, uh, Thompson Rivers University and Athabasca both provide um, courses that we have approved mm -hmm. in the past. If you are going to choose a course because we've said, hey, you need a chemistry course or hey, you need a math course, um, be sure to get it approved ahead of time um, by just emailing the program office. And we can basically pre-approve the course so that you don't spend time and money on a course. And then we look at it and go, Ooh, that's not a good, that course won't fit. Mm -hmm. um, it can save you a lot of hassle with, from, you know, choosing the wrong course. <laughs> okay. So this is something students often want to know. <laughs> what can I do next? <laughs> Um, it used to be the tagline of the university when it first started that you could get there from here. And in a lot of ways, that's really kind of true. So this is by no means an exhaustive list. Mm -hmm. um, Matt, do you want to add on to this a little bit? Here? Yeah, we have. I know Chris, uh, who's a doctor in uh, Newfoundland. 
Yeah, so, yeah actually, I haven't seen yeah. this in a while. He he dropped by the lab uh, just about uh, a couple of months ago. I was in the lab and he popped in, so uh, that's why I remember. So we've got students who have gone on to be doctors and environmental lawyers. We used to have a student who uh, went to U of A, became an environmental lawyer, and was actually one of the instruct instructors for the environmental law program. And well, the last year's uh, cohort. Um was doing law at the University of Saskatchewan this, this last year, mm -hmm. so. And then one of the students who came from uh, Quandling College is now doing a, uh, IUV doing environmental law. So we've got students who have gone on to do uh, different things. In terms of environmental consult, consult, consultants, <laughs> yeah, I know students in uh, Golder who are now in WSP, uh, Hemera in town, um, uh, SNC lab one. Uh, I know the Nelson office. I think we have about four of our students, students who graduated from Royal Roots working in there. I visited Nelson and Bob and I go, hey, this is like classroom. <laughs> uh, so environmental consultants, we have uh, most uh, a a few students a lot in there. Yeah. Um, lots of environmental managers and environmental coordinators is, uh, you know, for all kinds of big companies, small companies. Yeah. Um, CRD in Victoria. Uh, again, if you go to CRD, we have probably about 10 or more alumni working in there. This is a local uh, uh, office here. We've got some who are high. And even in DND, Department of National Defense here, the uh, base form formation officer is a former grad who did a BSc and then he went on, came back to do an MBA and he's now the one of the bosses there. So that's the uh, the federal side. Yeah. Um, um, one of our former students was an ADM in, in the environment department. Yeah. So, assistant deputy minister. So, but honestly, you know, the, we've had everything from students that have went on to teach school uh, with yeah. the environment as their focus to economic officers, all kinds of policy people. Um, you know, there's there's lots of opportunities to go on to graduate school in environmental science, um, not just in at Royal Roads, but in, uh, in other areas. And PhDs. Um, one yeah. of the instructors at uh, Olds that I know was one of uh, students who I did a major project with and with Ken kept in touch. He went to U of Ottawa to do his PhD and he's now a, an instructor at Olds College. Yeah, we've had a couple of those because mm -hmm. uh, Johanna Wolf also has a PhD. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so, you know, it really is a question of what do you think you want to do next, Yeah. right? And what I would really advise uh, students is even if you don't think you want to go to school later, like right now for a master's, you might later. <laughs> um, you know, lots of people do a master's degree in their 40s and 50s um, after they have have some more field experience as well. So there's lots of lots of options out there. So there was a question about the timing of the classes. Classes go from 8:30 to 4:30. Uh, 8:30 to 4:30 Pacific PC, time generally. PC time. Um. See, there you go. <laughs> um, okay, so blended program. The blended program generally runs what we would call more asynchronously. Um, for many courses, you may have one or two synchronous sessions, or maybe your instructor will do like a synchronous office hour on Zoom or something similar mm -hmm. like this, um, in which case, you know, there'll, there'll be something um, possibly during the day. Some instructors will do those things in the evenings. Um, yeah, I, I usually do mine at 5 p.m. BC time. Yeah. To allow um, people to get home from work. So it depends on the instructor. And depends on the instructor. The last yeah. two times I've taught a distance course, I've done office hours on Sunday afternoon because that was the, uh, that was the request from the class. So, um, Otherwise, a lot of what you're gonna do is in asynchronous discussion forums. And the reason that we've chosen that route is because of time zone differences like, uh, like what you're asking about, but also because 
uh, folks may be on shift work um, or have other obligations in their life. So, you know, I had a student a few years ago that it always looked like her posts went up between 4 a.m. and 7 a.m. Pacific time. But what was really happening was that she was in Eastern Canada getting up before her kids went to school, doing homework for a couple of hours. So all her posts would come in and then she had to go to work. So, <laughs> um, you know, you should have lots of opportunities to, to make things work. Um, and the other thing is the lectures are all are recorded. Yeah, exactly. So, so you if watch you it. wind up with a, you know, if there's a synchronous session and you absolutely can't make it, then, you know, things will get recorded and you can always pick up the recording mm -hmm. afterwards. So you've got more options than just, oh crap, I missed it. <laughs> The other nice thing about that asynchronousy is it means that you can have uh, team members in other parts of Canada, which gives mm -hmm. you more different perspectives on what you're learning, mm -hmm. um, rather than us having to go, okay, we'll put everybody in Ontario on the same team. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not that that doesn't sometimes happen, but it does give more options for, for different people you can work with. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing that'll be really exciting for the 2022 group, uh, for because there's several of you that mentioned that you were um, registered for that blended version, um, is you will also have an opportunity to have some classes with the class ahead of you, the 2021 group. Um, so again, it'll give you a larger group of peers to work with um, and some more perspectives on, on different things. So mm -hmm. it'll be pretty cool. And yes, definitely communication is the key. Um, if you don't communicate or answer to emails or this kind of thing, you are effectively absent and we can't tell that you're there or doing things. So um, you wanna make sure that you, you really do stay uh, plugged into those kinds of things. Yeah, and, I, and with the online class, if I notice that a student is not participating, I usually send them an email reminder. Hey, what's going on? Let's, is there anything I can do to help? Or uh, if there's a reason that you're not able to participate, let your team members know. And usually team members are, are very um, accommodating if you let them know. So communicate, communicate, communicate. Yeah, well, exactly. Um, you know, because I mean, I've had students that were going to, for instance, be away for a week. Um, the two best excuses for being away for a week uh, that I have had from my distance group was somebody was in the Arctic tagging whales. And one of the other uh, guys that was in one of the previous cohorts was in an underwater diving bell for a week. So, you know, but generally you don't get sent on those kind of things with no notice. So if you know you're going to be away, it's really up to you to, to communicate with your team and your instructor. Uh, do we have options for living accommodations for students coming for the three weeks uh, for the blended program? Um, usually the answer to that is yes. What that's going to look like by the time we get to May of 2020, 22, I am not 100% sure, but yes, maybe. <laughs> it's probably the best way to put that at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Usually the answer to that is, is yes. Yes, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, for somebody that works full-time, it's the average hours per week required for the blended program. Um, you are usually going to spend somewhere between 30 and 35 hours a week. Having said that, if you are in a course that you're really good at and you have lots of experience with, you are likely to spend less. If you are in a course that you are struggling with, you are likely to spend more. Mm -hmm. yep. So 30, 35 hours a week is probably a reasonable average. Um, but the thing to do is to really make sure that, for instance, your spouse, your kids, the people you work with are aware of when your scheduled homework time is, because um, you have to protect that homework time. Um, otherwise you're gonna, gonna find yourself kind of scrambling. 
Um, looking for information about Canada's updated travel rules for international students. Oh, there we go. Christine's giving you some more information and the COVID update stuff. Excellent. <laughs> right. Yeah, at this point, perhaps we could move on to the application process. But um, if anybody has any other questions that come up about what we just talked about, keep adding them to the chat box and we'll keep answering them as we go along. But thank you so much, um, Matt and Mickey for providing all that program information. So many great questions in the chat box today too and really excited about all the different um, journeys that you're all telling us about uh, for getting into the program and what's next for you and everything. Okay, so for the application process, we touched a little bit on the prereqs and all of those sort of things, but just to dig into it a bit more. So for our standard admissions, what that looks like is the completion of an approved transfer program um, with minimum B GPA or the completion of the prerequisite courses with a minimum B grade in each and, or the completion um, of an arts or science diploma or 60 credits, including a minimum of 24 second year credits with a minimum GPA of a B from a recognized post-secondary institution. If that's not you, there are still options. <laughs> yes, exactly. So then moving on to what flexible admissions looks like. So this would be, for example, for applicants who do not meet the standard admissions requirements and the completion of prerequisite courses among, with a minimum of a B grade in each. Um, this might include significant relevant experience in the field to compensate for some of the um, things that may be missing under that standard admission requirements. And then this is assessed on a case by case basis. So of course, um, yeah, we'll take a look holistically at any of the experience that you have and your application in general and be in communication with you about that process as well. Um, also just a point here, if you are, uh a past or current member of the Canadian Armed Forces, please also get your training record as part of your admissions documents, because sometimes you have relevant experience hiding in that training document. Good tip indeed. Yes, and I see Christine is posting some of the links you can find with the admissions criteria and everything, so you can look at that later as well. Uh, question, is it realistic to think I can maintain full-time work for the blended program or do you see people moving to more of a part-time position school, so school isn't delayed? Um, it, it's realistic to think you can do it, but you need to be well organized. Um, and like I say, you need to know when your homework time is. <laughs> and so does your spouse and <laughs> anybody else that's involved in your life um so that you can balance those things uh because honestly there's nothing more frustrating than you know my homework time is saturday afternoon and that's always when i get asked you know to go for groceries or something like that and you know so it's it's all about communication with the other people in your life as well but it is totally doable to be working full-time um and doing the program at the same time um when choosing courses, okay, so because this is a cohort program, you all take the same courses in the same order at the same time. So you don't actually have elective courses in, in the program. So choosing courses isn't really a problem because we self-organize that for you, um, which makes life a little simpler. Um, have I seen anyone take three or four years for the blended program? Um, People do usually shoot to complete in two, um, but sometimes life happens. And if life happens, then yes, it can take three or four years to, to complete the program. Um, so as an example, um, I had a student in a cohort a few years ago, started his program. He was deployed to Afghanistan. Um, continued taking distance courses. We had to skip over a residency because he couldn't come home to Canada. Um, we set him up on a completion plan and over the course of, his, of the four years that it took him to complete the program, he was deployed to Afghanistan twice and the Arctic once. So the best request for, um, for a, a leave from the program I saw from him was reason for leave. And he wrote chasing the Americans around the Arctic. <laughs> so, <laughs> he was being deployed on a, on a 
like as an exercise of several weeks. So most people will complete in two, but you know, if life happens, life happens. And that's why we have a thing called the completion plan, which helps us to help you when life happens. <laughs> and I see from Amanda here, um, so we're looking at four to five hours, seven days a week worth of homework on top of attending class, just checking or just confirming. Does that um, sound about right? Probably, yes. Um, that's probably fair. Keeping in mind that for the blended program, that four to five hours probably includes the time that you're sitting, uh, responding to online discussion chats and things like that as well. Right. So. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Alrighty, and a bit more about how to apply. So we have an online application fee of $126.28 to start off the process. And then here's some of the supporting documents to go with that. So for all applications, we will need your official transcripts from whichever previous institutions you've attended. And those do need to arrive to us sealed. So um, if you are curious to learn what your grades were, if you've been out of school for a few years, it's always best to get one set of transcripts sent to yourself and the other ones uh, sent <laughs> straight to us because they do need to be sealed. And as well right now, um, some institutions are doing email transfer uh, transcripts instead of sending mail ones and we're accepting those as well. So don't fret about that aspect of things. And then some documents that may be requested if um, you would be more considered for that flexible admissions side of things. So we have here a detailed resume. So this can be quite a bit longer than your typical job application resume, I would say. Um, it can be as lengthy as you need to really communicate all of your previous experience that would be relevant to your application, whether that is, of course, your um, education experience, professional experience, but as well things like like volunteer experience, um, specific projects you worked on, um, anything that you feel is relevant, this is a great place to put it down there. And then to go with that would be a personal statement. So this is a um, two page document that really again maps out um, exactly why you want to be in the program, going through all of your experience again, and anything that you want to share with us. And I'm wondering, um, Mickey or Matt, is there anything that you typically look for or any advice that you can give for that personal statement aspect of things? Because I know it can be a little bit nerve wracking to start that one off. Um, this is a really where you tell us where, where you think you want to go and how the program is going to help you get there. Um, if you have um, any extenuating circumstances, or, you know, for instance, let's say you had a really terrible semester, one semester, because something happened in your personal life. Your personal statement is a place to explain that. Um, you know, and um, you should explain any of those sort of uh, anomalies. But really, why, why do you want to be uh, in environmental science? What's that going to, to do, right? What kinds of things do you think Perfect, thank you. And just a quick correction from Christine. The length is one page, not two pages. So, and she added a bit more information as well about that document in the chat box. So the last thing on here is two letters of reference. So it is ideal if those come in the form of um, one professional and then one educational reference, but there is a bit of wiggle room there if you've been out of school for a long amount of time, say for example. And with that one, a best practice as well as if we can receive the references directly from whoever is referring you um, with their professional email addresses, just so we can confirm who it's coming from. Yeah, and uh, they should be from professional, not from your buddy. We've got, we've sometimes received reference letters from somebody's friend. He's a really good drinking buddy. Well, not quite that way, but <laughs> that's not what we're looking for. Somebody, somebody's lab partner was one I got a few years ago. I was like, hmm, okay. 
Yeah. So not your mom or your friend, <laughs> preferably, but yes, yeah, so somebody from an educational background, professional background. Um, and thank you, Christine, for adding more details in there about those reference letters. So for the key dates, our next on-campus intake will start September 7th, 2021, and the application deadline is coming up pretty soon, June 7th, 2021, and the next blended intake will start on April 19th, 2022. The application deadline for that is in January, and of course there's dates um, further past that if you are looking for further down the, um, down the road, but if you are thinking of applying, it's best to start thinking about all those documents you might need and start putting together your application um, as soon as you can. And I will note, if you are applying as an international student, it is best to apply even six months ahead of time before the program would start if you are going to need to organize the study permit um, portion of things, because that can take a little bit of time to organize. And if you do need to relocate, things like that, um, the more planning time, the better. And I see a question here already from Brandon about the articulation agreement with Algonquin College. Yeah, that depends on which program you uh, attended. So what I'll suggest is uh, it's uh, available on the website. Yeah, so there's a link. Yeah. yeah, and if you do want to reach out to Christine with that afterwards to dig into the details a bit more, um, she can help you navigate that as well. Perfect, thank you. And another portion of things is financial aid. So this is a very important part of planning um, your educational journey. Um, I used this team as a resource when I was applying to Royal Roads and they were super helpful in helping me navigate all of the awards and bursary options. And I did get some of those options, which was amazing. And then also helping navigate like BC student loans and things like that. So definitely doesn't hurt to reach out to them. And um, we do have a smaller student body than some other institutions. So you have a pretty good chance of actually getting some of these awards and bursaries if you just apply. So um, definitely something to consider. And of course, we've been talking about um, our amazing team, Christine being one of them, the whole webinar, but um, here's their contact information again, if you do want to reach out with more information. Um, the top contact there is if you'd be applying as a Canadian student and the bottom email there is if you are looking for more information from the international side of things. And I will say um, as another opportunity for you to learn more about the Royal Roads experience, about more some of these services like financial aid, um, the library, um, student services in general, anything like that, we are hosting an open house event next week that's all virtual and it will all be recorded so you can watch it at any time that you want. So I think Selena, if you're still on the call, if you could pop a link to our virtual open house page into the chat box. Perfect there, she just did. So if you are looking into more information, please check out that event next week. And we'll also be hearing from some students who have taken um, uh, programs within our School of Environment and Sustainability. So definitely a session that you might wanna bookmark to check out next week. And with that, I will do a final last call for any questions that you have. Now is a great time to pop those into the chat box and we'll make sure that we answer them. But um, Mickey or Matt, is there any final things that we may have missed that you wanna share before we end the webinar today? Um, if you wanna see what's going on in the School of Environment and Sustainability, um, we do have a blog. Um, I think Christine has the link to our blog probably. Um, the library uh, is the library link is available on from the Royal Roads website. Um, once you have been admitted as a student, and you, then you'll have access to the uh, to the online contents. But yeah, you can go to our blog and see the the happenings in the department and some of the research that's going on, um, things that the various faculty and students are involved in. It's kind of a neat place to go. Matt, anything else you'd like to share? Oh, I think you might just be muted. Yeah, I was, sorry. <laughs> I was uh, thinking of major projects. For those of you who are thinking of the on-campus program, the major project is a really good 
good uh, hands-on experience. Uh, you learn not only to work on a project, but you learn to work with each other and then work with your sponsors, the public, and lots of presentations here on campus. So if you are shy of doing presentations, by the end of the program, you'll be good at it <laughs> because we'll make you, almost every course, class has a presentation in it. And then the major project, we have uh, presentations all along. So your communication skills will be by the time you're done here. Really important skill to learn for sure. I see a follow-up question about the um, library access and if you already do have access to the REU website. Um, perhaps if you could follow up with us afterwards, then we can maybe see if we can help troubleshoot and um, see where we can help you get access to the library if you are already enrolled. So the library uh, was done for a while. The online journal access was done for a while. So probably maybe that's why. Yeah, that so could be it too. Looks like Christine's provided a direct link as well. So yeah, here we go. Perfect, amazing. And with that, um, we're just about to hit the end time of our webinar today. So I think we will end it here, but thank you so much for answer, uh, for asking all the questions that you did and for joining us today. And again, if any other questions pop up later on, feel free to reach out to us and we're happy to help. Um, thank you, Matt and Mickey for joining today and for sharing so much amazing program information and for our team behind the scene, scenes, Christine, uh, Selena, I believe Kish was here as well. So thank you all so much um, for helping bring this webinar to life today. Alrighty. And Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Yeah, have a good day.